Hi, this is Seamless, and today this is the uh, making of Connector, the um, electro track I released recently. Uh, so I'm just going to go through it chronologically, 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 and uh, I will learn you some music. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand all of these uh, freaking envelopes down here. Because I do do a lot with uh, automation in the beginning, especially. Not so much in the later time, but um, the later time. Across the ages, things happen that are more or less responsible entirely for... Man, I can't talk and do stuff at the same time. Jeez. Learn to speak. Learn to use words. All right. Okay. Uh, there's two more. Dude, there's probably more um, later on. No, is that all of them? That's pretty cool. All right. So I'm going to play a bit of the intro, and then I will explain what's going on. So this little bit right here is probably interesting you, and you're also probably wondering what these chords are. What is making this? Doing these kinds of chords is like a, is among one of the easier things that I can do that's not a bass type thing. Um, I'm using Harmer to do it, but uh, the way that I do it in Harmer can be done in just about any other um, plugin. Really, all you really need is some uh, saw waves and distortion. And uh, any plugin that has any kind of unison, basically. So, actually, let's see, what am, I, what am I doing in this? Right here. Okay. All right. So, I did a, that's something a tiny bit more complicated in Harmer, in Harmer that you really couldn't do in something that's not Harmer, but the effect um, is only just for a little bit of zazz. And there are even ways that you could accomplish this without Harmer, but they're just really complicated and stupid. So, um, let's listen to what these chords sound like opened up. So what's going on here is that they're uh, saw waves um, with a little bit of unison stuff going on. And then I have the harmonizer engaged. But what the harmonizer is really doing here is that it's um, octaving, octaving basically uh, one uh, one octave or a bit more higher than that. The uh, harmonizer's um, harmonizer, harmonizer's harmonizer uh, is a little bit more complicated than just transposing something. What it actually does is it copies the uh, partials. Uh, uh, which partials that you got you copy is determined by the width of the strength knobs here and and that kind of stuff, and then. Uh, it pastes it. It, it 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 transposes the partials above it, or where it, it transposes the partials based on where you tell it to on these controls here. I don't really mess with those. I normally just stick to the base, the default harmonizer setting because it sounds good to me. But if you wanted to do this in some other plugin that didn't have a harmonizer, you could just go into your MIDI here and copy and paste this and just paste it up top, and it had more or less the same effect. So there's also a little bit of unison going on, and I messed with the. Uh, uh, unis, uh, harmonic unison pitch, which is uh, a, a line editor option in Harmer that allows you to tell Harmer what frequencies are being applied um, unison to and by how much. That's what it says. It's a really a very compl complex thing and it can do really amazing stuff and I tend to utilize it a lot for bass, but I guess I was just screwing around for this. Um, I have a filter engaged here in the, in the beginning but then I'm also distorting it. I'm using soft saturation distortion, which uh, is a type of distortion that's usually found in compressors, kind of, kind of, kind of deal, kind of stuff. But the point of it is that it's light. It's a very light kind of high frequency distortion. So um, and that's what gives it that um, like organy kind of uh, old school feel, especially when I turn the filter down. Uh, 
Now, as for notes, it's mostly uh, minor stuff that's going on. Um, okay, so here we have root five and three, uh, minor three, and then we have minor seven, four, major two. That kind of interplay between major and minor uh, chords with the distortion and like this kind of stuff, it creates um, fun things after it gets to be distorted. The distortion really just does fun stuff to everything that's ever happened. I like distortion a lot. Um, I use a similar chord setup in some in my track sometime. In fact, I probably just took this straight out of sometime and then messed with it a little bit because I don't think I even knew about the harmonic use and pitch thing when I made sometime. I might not have. I might have. I don't really remember. Um, these these chords are being uh, helped out by uh, this bass here. And that's also a little bit where we go, we go back to this uh, automation business that happened here. The uh, bass comes in high past. When, uh, and what I mean by that is that on the bass, on that bass, in what channel? I don't remember. You know I have it labeled number three right there, main bass. I have a low filter, which uh, I'm using the high pass option on the basic filter that's set up. But what that basically means, it's the opposite of a low pass filter, if you're not familiar with what filters do. And what this does is it cuts the low frequencies until uh, you are cut only to the highest frequencies. And so that's why it comes in all crackly and only like the high frequencies until it eventually opens up to all the low frequencies. So I control the uh, fil the chord filter here. Uh, insert forty eight. Ah, see, all of these, all of these automation clips are all labeled their insert numbers before I actually um, moved all the mixer inserts are back to a reasonable location. So that means that, like, uh, probably the main base was at one point um, at insert forty eight. So let's see what your you were originally insert nine. So insert nine was this guy. So if I were to just do that. Absolutely nothing would happen because I'm silencing something that's important. I wonder what it could be. That's probably the the volume. Yeah. Now it's doing that because uh, not only do I have not only do I have um, the filter going on, but I have this pattern going on. And in this particular bass, it was a type of bass that I used in Harmer. It has a whole lot of weird units and stuff going on, and the fun the fun thing about uh, weird units and stuff is that it freezes my computer. <clears throat> and this particular kind of units and stuff, it, it creates an interesting type of texture. Now, I believe, I believe, yes. So, what's going on here is that um, I have prism and I have the units engaged. However, they don't they aren't engaged for the forever. See, prism actually cuts off after a second. And it's the same thing with uh, the unison pitch thickness. Now, I do that because I want the main bass to be consistent, but I want it to have an interesting texture. And so I let the unison do its work um, for a second, and then it stays consistent after that initial second. And so this, um, the modulation of the high pass filter and also the weird pitch stuff that I did here, combined with the various bass settings, created that interesting little filter moment. So other fun things that are happening um, down in the automation is that they're mostly controlling how this uh, noise channel works. This is just a citrus with a channel, one op going out set to have the noise all the way up. So it's just noise, and then I'm filtering it. It's really all there is to that. 
And then, um, as well as filtering it, I have reverb and delay and stuff going on. And then uh, I have, so that was Insert 48. So I have the cutoff, which is causing the, uh, the whoosh to happen. I'm also um, controlling the resonance because I want there to be really high resonance for when it falls because it creates that kind of interesting uh, high frequency motion in the in the cut the cutoff sweep. And however, I didn't start off with high resonance because as if you have really high resonance at a really high cutoff value, it will hurt a lot. It will hurt your ears. It's really bad. You can EQ it, or you could just control when the resonance becomes peaked. And I did the same thing with the uh, um, with the uh, delay input. Now, what I'm what I'm controlling here is uh, the the input amount of the delay. So that means that this delay channel isn't doesn't have the full input the whole time. It only has the input when this automation clip here is det is determining it should. And what that's doing is that it's saving um, it's saving it from having the really hard click bounce. Bouncing around in the reverb in the delay, and so it only has the smooth fall of the uh, of the uh, filter sweep. So that's pretty much what that is. And then I have this reverb here that's actually on the uh, main bass that is creating additional whoosh. And then cutting immediately because that's a cool effect. Now I have an arp. Now, there is more than one way more than one way to do arpeggios in any plugin really. Harmer has its own internal um ARP stuff that I don't really mess with. And that's because in um FL Studio, doing ARPs in the uh, sampler window, the channel settings window here is actually way easier for me. I mean I I'm just used to doing that. And so in here we have the uh, ARP settings. And you can tell you can tell it how fast to ARP uh the gate. So like the, what the gate does is it's just very clear. Now I have the chord set to auto sustain, which means that it'll arp the chord that I have playing here, which is handy. But you can also set it to arp all manner of cool chords and modes and stuff like that. Um, then the range, you can hit set the repeat, randomness. Uh, uh, right now I have it going up and down. You can have it go up and down and play the, the first and last note twice. You have it go only up and only down, that kind of thing. And uh, that's how I do my arps. And then I just make the chords as they are. And then the sound is just a very simple saw wave thing. Probably distorted. No, it's not distorted at all. Interesting. I phased it. Lightly. A little bit of filter going on. Didn't really do much of that because it's a pretty simple sound. It's just there to support. And then I have this lead. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure this is just yeah, this is just a preset um, from the uh, from from Harmer called Gamer. And I actually used this in uh, Bass Antix for a similar purpose, and it worked pretty well then. So I decided to do it then to do it again. Yes, uh, and not choir. Not choir is hilarious. So um, what this was is a patch that I tried to make to be a. Uh, a higher frequency filler for the drop, actually. Like, I wanted this, it's, I mean, it is in the drop, but I wanted it to uh, be a kind of a sharp, stabby lead type thing for the drop. And then what I ended up, and then I put like reverb and some stuff on it. And then what ended up happening is that it actually kind of sounds like a choir, but not when it's by itself. Hilariously. It's also, it's all, oops, no, that. It's also not very loud because it hasn't. It sounds kind of weird by itself, but um, I'm actually I'm gonna play a bit of the drop that has it in it and just like listen to how much it sounds like a chorus, a choir. That's actually where I turned it off. And 
So that's why I kept it, even though it failed completely at its original purpose. But I mean, that's kind of how I make a lot of my sounds. Is I try to do one thing, I end up doing something completely different. And what I end up doing, I like. So that's what that is. And now you'll see over here at the lead section that this is all chopped up and weird. And that's because I actually, instead of just making a new pattern, I chopped up the uh, original pattern for the lead and then rearranged it to make this lead outro business. <laughs> Same thing with the bass up here. I just chop up the the patterns like that, and then I just rearrange them as I see fit. And it's for like immediately arranging something. It's really much easier to do that than uh, make a whole new pattern just for one thing. At least for me. And here's what I actually did end up using for the uh, the drop at, uh, high frequency filler. And uh, I made a video a while ago called How to Laser, which covers a lot of a lot of these sounds. Also some cool stuff that I didn't uh, employ in this track, but I just had the pitch envelope doing that and some unison and probably, yeah, this has this distortion, all kinds of weirdness. And there's not really much to that. And so what's coming up here is this phase riser. And I have used this more or less in all my tracks, at least something like this. But you can't hear it. So what that's doing is, uh, ooh, where are you at? Uh, oh, it's actually in the automation clips for some reason. Okay. I forgot about that. So, um, when it has volume, it's even still at number 54. Wow. Uh, I have, I have, I have failed my organizational paradigm. So um, the rising effect is actually being controlled in the piano roll via a slide note. That's what this is. Um, I could had to, I could have done that in the uh, the pitch envelope here. I could have just made a big huge riser rise kind of thing. So that, that would be that, that would make that so that's what the sound only does, which would have been appropriate for this track because that's all I ever use it for. Um, and if you're going to, if you're using a DAW or if you're using a third party VST that can't use slide notes, that's something that you can do is use your plugins internal uh, pitch envelope to make a riser sound. Um, but I like using, I mean, I use all FL native stuff anyway. So slide notes it is. And so that's just controlling the actual rise. Um, I, and now the, the LFO effect that's happening on the phaser is actually being controlled by the phaser speed as you saw me messing with it here. And um, this can't be controlled internally, so I just automated it, and then it's being controlled over here by this automation clip. As you see, it's going down because the speed knob is not 0 to 100. It's negative 100 to 100, and so 0 is middle position, and I decided to go negative 100 for that moment. And so that's why it's 50% and down. And so then we get to the first inkling of the drop. <laughs> Much like the main bass, I employed a uh, high pass filter to uh, give the actual drop more emphasis. So, first things first, um, or computer freezing is cool. Um, I want to talk about the main bass because the main bass actually does two things. Um, it is, in fact, the main, you know. Now I have um, on this bass, I have Porta engaged here. And I think I also did it in the channel settings window just for ultimate redundancy. Nope, I didn't do it at all. So I have Porta engaged and that makes it so that if I play a low note and go to a high note, the first time I do that, it does that little slidey thing. 
And when you do that and then distort it, it kind of sounds like a, a nice, interesting kind of kick sound. Like a, because uh, that's mostly how kicks are made anyway. That's what they do. But um, when I said that this, that this bass does two things, is that uh, people listen to this track and they assume that the higher, the higher moments in the bass, like this stuff, are actually another instrument. And nope, it's just a bass. It's just a bass played higher than your, than the average. <laughs> And here I, I like to do the uh, slidey thing with a slide note. <laughs> kind of deal. So let's talk about how this bass is actually made. Now, I, talk, I talked earlier about how um, I control the use of pitch thickness and then also the prism. Now, I'm, in, in the case of the prism, I don't want the pitch to get too far apart, which is why I made it... Um, <laughs> Which is why I made it uh, cut off after a second. And then I have I have a uh, the the B side here, which is just a normal square wave. <coughs> I sneezed and I have a bass. Oh, I'm gonna do it again. Am I? No, I'm not. So at the B side here, I have it uh, just a normal square wave. Um. Not a whole lot. I got a little bit of unison and phase difference, and I'm doing that. <coughs> wow, I'm doing that to uh, um, uh, bleh, reinforce the fundamental of the uh, first one here. Now I could just engage fundamental protection, harmonic protection here, which is what's called, which uh, basically ensures that the fundamental, the lowest note, will always be playing. So no matter what you're doing, there's going to be a, a reinforcement. And you could even uh, input uh, different subs, sub uh, harmonics at like the one and the five and the the other one. And you could tell if it's above or below the fundamental, which I have never used just because I haven't had to or haven't found something useful enough to do that with. Um, but that's what's, that's what's basically going on here. Oh, I think I actually changed the prism type. I should check. Oh, I did. All right. So in how to base 12, I think I, I talked about um, what the prism does and also what the harmonic unison does and harmer. And basically what prism, this is the harmonic prism uh, type right here. And what this graph uh, indicates is what pitches are going to be moved where. So it's kind of like a unison only um, instead of it, I'm pretty sure it doesn't follow the tone. I'm pretty sure. No, I guess it does because it's set in octaves and not in hertz. So, um, what this basically does is that, like, if I if I move the knob, like I have the knob all out here at um, a positive a positive amount, which means that the frequencies that occupy these octaves are going to be moved up this way and that way and this way and that way and this way according to where these these points are. The default prism looks like this, and if you move it around, it'll move. No, uh, parts of the frequencies that are around the fundamental. When you do that, it creates a very not harmonic sound, which is good for certain applications. Like uh, using Prism for this with this setup can actually make a really nice, like metallic, bellish sounding attack, because the uh, the not harmonic nature that it creates is more associated to um, like clunky metallic noises than an actual tone. So what I have done here is that I've removed um, all Prism activity below um, a certain amount of octaves, apparently, so that um, the fundamental isn't changed at all, but you still get the kind of, the sort of squelchy, interesting effect that you get when you split frequencies like this up up top. A little bit of that is also going on with the uh, prism, I mean the harmonic unison, and you get that similar effect like that, but uh, doing it with the harmer also, or the, bleh, the prism, doing it with the prism uh, accentuates that effect. Uh, when I fell. Okay. All right, let's find a pattern that's not retarded. Hear that kind of squelch going on? That's what that is. That's why that exists. 
So then over here is the uh, the uh, Vocadux bass. What's going on here? Now, I've done this before in um, other tracks. I did it in Third Watch, and I've also covered it in How to Bass. But what I'm doing here is I have a, uh, a bass sound that I've made in Harmer that I'm running into a Vocadux channel. Uh, the, basically, the Harmer is the carrier. It's going to get the Vocadux. Yeah. <laughs> And the modulator is actually an FM patch in Citrus. Because FM, as you know, like here's a normal FM sound. It kind of has that um, formant quality to it. And I've covered why that happens in How to Base 6. And uh, so, and so this means that instead of using an actual vocal sample or something like that, I'm using the formant FM as the... Uh, modulator for the harbor carrier and i covered that in how to base 24 which was actually a preview of this track now this does interesting things because um what kind of format activity that an fm base has uh is determined by the fm amount the fm wave shape and then also the pitch that is to say if i were to have enough this fm sound and then I were to like play an extremely high note. If I were to record that out and then just pitch shift it, it wouldn't really have uh, the format qualities that if I played it at the low note. And it's not just because of artifacts of pitch shifting; it's because it's not the same. But pitch wise, you get different kind, you get different format activity. So, with that in mind, the idea here is that we're moving, uh, we're moving the carrier and the modulator independently, independently in pitch. The carrier is not the same pitch as the modulator. The modulator is not at all in key with the uh, the um, carrier. So let's take this let's take this pattern here for example. I'm gonna turn this guy off. So let's take let's take away this and just have this one solid note. This also means that if I were to change the pitch of the carrier, it wouldn't really be affected. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be affected uh, with the FM, which is interesting. So I can have uh, a low note type um, FM formant, but have a high note in the fundamental frequency in the carrier. Similarly, I could have a low note, but have a high, a high note uh, FM type. So, what's going on in the actual Vocodex plugin here? So, I have the uh, the base cut here for for the module the the band game multiplier because I'm letting the um, carrier pass through in on those frequencies here uh, as set by these these faders and this knob. This is um, a low pass filter. So if I were to just play that by itself, you'd hear that and other stuff because I also have the low going out into another channel here. And it's going to get to the sidechain bus. So if I actually disabled that, those frequencies are only coming out of, uh, or those frequencies are coming out of um, the main uh, band gable, the, the main fader up here. And it's being stopped from these guys from coming out because they don't really add that much useful sound to the uh so that's actually the, that that sound here is actually all that what vocal deck is, is doing That is a uh, fraps problem, if you're wondering. So, 
Um, in here, I have um, order four going on, and I have a hundred bands, which is not something that I do a lot. Um, but I just I just I determined that it actually sounded kind of the, the best when I did it this time, which is why I do things. Um, I have I have the uh, modulator pitch shift pitch pitched pretty low, which actually means that it's um, affecting the type of um, FM sounds that are coming in already. And I just did that because I like just in general I like the lower type sounds more than the higher type sounds. So I decided to accentuate that by lowering the pitch even further. And then here I have the uh, band with multiplier uh, facing more towards um, the car or the, mod bleh, the modulator, which makes it makes the uh, the behavior here more defined, along with the hundred bands. Uh, the attack and hold and release are actually kind of all normal right now, normal type things. And then and modulator pitch shift was only a few tiny adjustments that I made. Because largely the um, FM sounds were already doing what I wanted to do vocally and format wise. I didn't have to do a whole lot of activity with the uh, modulator pitch shift that I usually do if I were to use a vocal sample, vocal sample or something like that. So all in all, this is actually a relatively simple uh, Vocodex patch happening right here. In the, in the, the carrier of the modulator um, and the uh, modulator, I actually, I'm actually using a Maximus to uh, super crush um, each of the bands so that they are all like all being represented in the sound because while you can't hear the modulator itself, um, how well represented each of the bands are uh, uh, affects the modulator, the modulation in the Vocodex because that's what it sees. It sees the uh, frequency presence and then applies that as bands, like a kind of like an EQ analysis. <laughs> kind of, but not actually like an EQ analysis. Just keep that in mind. So then the other sound is that's going on here is just a normal FM bass. Let's use this one. I have that going on in the patcher, and I am doing a basic frequency split here, doing low, mid, and high, just to give it more uh, spread and kind of interesting thing. I have, a, I have a, a short reverb going on, and the high frequencies here, and they're they're all not they're not very uh, full, like. And then I have the low going on all by itself, just so that there's a little, little bit of representation going on there. And that's just that that sound doesn't really do a whole lot in this track. It just kind of does that. <laughs> And then there's a high feather again. It has the feather down. I believe I touched on most of the important parts in the drop. And then eventually the uh, chords come back. So, um, modulate, modulation wise, um, I have only two automations going on for the uh, Vocodex patch. I have the um, FM amount as controlled by modulator modulator X, modifier X in um, Citrus. And then I also have a filter going on in the main carrier, uh, main carrier, which I don't really do much with. I do it very seldomly, but it's there. And that's, I used it a few times. Now, there have been many, plenty of questions about how to get um, mod X and mod Y to do stuff in Citrus, so I'm going to show you real quick. Um, in Citrus, kind of like kind of like Harmer, Harmer has um, Harmer has uh, the parameters here in this envelope setup and or in this window setup here, and then it has <clears throat> modifiers that you can use to modulate the envelopes. So I guess you can call it modulators. So then. Uh, he has X, Y, and Z mapping and whatever. Now, the thing is that by default, these things are not mapped. You have to map them. So in Citrus, you have a, the row here, which are all the things that are in Citrus that you can mess with. OSC is a special tab. It's very tab-based. And then here, here you have all the modifiers. You have the envelope, the LFO, key, 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 uh, the key modulator, key mapping, velocity mapping, mod X, mod Y, random, randomization, and unison mapping, which I covered in how to base... Uh, 13, 14, something like that. One of those, I forget. <clears throat> anyway, so go to mod X and you see here that I have um, the mod here, which mod up in the tab stands for the FM modulation input, input modulation. 
and then mod X stands for modifier X, or modul modulation X, whatever. And so then I, by default, it's this. And what this means is that the values are always going to be 100% what the values are, regardless of the position of, of modifier X. <laughs> Uh, let's go up here just so there's more activity. So you see the, the line moving there? That's the position of the X knob. Of the freezing fraps. That's what's going on right now. Because fraps. It's been doing it a lot more lately. Okay, there we go. Uh, so this knob's position is represented by the line here. So... By default, you're greedy with this window. So I take this line, move it down, and you have the most basic X mapping right now, which is to say that when X is all the way down, the, the parameter value is all the way down, and when X is all the way up, the parameter is all the way up. You can do cool stuff like change the tension of that so that um, you get more uh, different articulation, or you can even add in more points just to do really wacky things. Like, you're, you are not terribly limited by what you can do with that, but I tend to just do direct mapping so that stuff is pretty straightforward that's how that works you do the same thing with mod y and that kind of stuff so you find a find a parameter you want and an operator you want and then apply that to the uh modifier the ones where mod x is by default in the center is because those are the ones that have positive and negative values attributed to them yeah 